I think no heart is untouched by the cluck cluck of horses. <laughs> it seems that that's that's one of those one of those sounds that uh, even if we don't remember it from our childhood, we we sort of feel like we do. Uh, they they most generally they think that this is a hard life, a really hard, disciplined life. But I don't think so. I mean, I I never considered it a difficult, hard life. It was simple life. It's just a place where people feel comfortable with. Family is very important. And uh, locally, it's like, locally it's like a man that gives you a handshake and gives you his word. That's a contract. I mean, it's just, that's how life is around here. When people come here, it's about shopping. It's about eating. It's about looking. But it's more about feeling. <laughs> There's a sense of, let's go to Holmes County. It will make us feel good. It's tinged a little with nostalgia. It's tinged a little bit with that sense that there's a better life out there. And there are people who come here believing that we have something they can't have at home. Not true, but there's a sense of that. It's, it's a lot different than life outside of the area where you go 24 hours a day. Here you, you do stop. At 8 o'clock, it's over. Everything's closed. And uh, most of the shops even close at 5 o'clock here. But, and you know what? People enjoy it because then they t take walks and you know, do things that they would not do at home. This is one of the top tourist destinations in the United States. Each year, more than 4 million people visit Holmes County, home to the world's largest population of the Amish. Its 423 square miles are home to about 40,000 people, and by one estimate, nearly 31,000 of those people are Amish. But Holmes County, like this program, is really of two characters. Part of it is simple and made of fields and hard work. Part of it is about growth and about commerce. For a place famous for simplicity, the story of Holmes County is actually very complex. We'll start the story at the beginning. The name Amish comes from Jacob Amon, a minister who split from the Swiss Anabaptist Church in the 1600s. By the 1800s, Amish families had settled in Pennsylvania, and in 1809, Jonas Stutzman built the first Amish home in Holmes County. He was soon joined by other families with names that continue to be recognizable today to travelers in Holmes County, names like Miller, Yoder, Troyer, Beachy, Schlebaugh, and Schrock. Usually we start our day, the bakers will come in at... Uh depending on uh, if it's weekend or during the week, four or five in the morning. Okay, I'll just give you a quick little overview of what you're gonna do and where you're gonna be and what we have for you to see. We'll start baking bread, uh, pies, uh, then we have our, our cooks come in at uh, six in the morning and they will start preparing the mashed potatoes, the roast beef, the chicken. We'll, we'll be breading our chicken, we'll be peeling our potatoes, uh, so on and so forth at 6 in the morning. The Amish door in Wilmot, Ohio is one of many Amish kitchens operating near Holmes County and on any given day more than a thousand people may pass through the gift shops, the restaurant or the bed and breakfast. Our banquet room is behind me and we'll go around the building and unload you right there. When we go inside your room will be on the left. Usually we've got to have everything ready to go by 11 o'clock now we serve breakfast uh, starting at 7 in the morning so our grill cooks and stuff are in also at 6 and they have to prepare uh, to serve breakfast and then about 10.30 where they have to shut down and then start preparing for uh, uh, lunch and dinner. You have chicken and, chicken and roast beef family style meal which is an all you can eat meal so make sure you save room for your pie because there's no take home with all you can eat.
Today, a busload of tourists from the Pittsburgh area have made the trek to the Amish door for lunch and a quick trip to the gift shop. Busloads of tourists and lines out the door are common sights for many of the half dozen Amish kitchens operating near Holmes County. But the Amish door had humble origins. Formerly called Stucky's, just a real small restaurant. At that time, uh, there really wasn't any significant Amish tourism. Then, in the 1980s, the Amish door, like many other Holmes County businesses, experienced a huge growth spurt. It's one of the most dramatic things in Ohio. It's one of the most dramatic things in America. Twenty years ago, um, it was not known for tourism. There was very little traffic, not the number of businesses there are. A handful of places to stay overnight, several good restaurants, and that's what people came here to do was to experience a, uh, a visit to an Amish restaurant. And we really had no uh, idea that it would happen the way it did. It took off probably around the mid-80s, 1985 or so. It started to become more recognized as a place to go, vacation destination or overnight or a getaway. They can come here and stay at night. Uh, eat breakfast in the morning, they can shop, they can go into Amish country and do some shopping and then when they come back they can have dinner here uh, in the evening and enjoy the surroundings uh, after they're done eating dinner before they go back to, to their room. The people are so friendly, so friendly and courteous of course, you know, but that's what brings us back here. Yeah, you know, and everything's like handmade and made from scratch and it just takes you back like you're going back into the old times, you know, it sort of makes you feel feel like you're living both worlds, you know. I, I just love the Amish, but I couldn't live like that. I mean, I, I'm, I, I have to have my TV. <laughs> meet Eli. Eli is one of the first Amish people that tourists meet in Sugar Creek. Home to the annual Swiss Festival, Sugar Creek is actually part of Tuscarora's County, but visitors might think they've stumbled into Switzerland. Most of the buildings in downtown Sugar Creek look like Swiss chalets perhaps a nod to the Swiss Anabaptist roots of the Amish. But for tourists, it's a place to snap a picture with Eli or pick up their official Amish country t-shirt. You can hop a steam train in downtown Sugar Creek and take a short ride, and even the banks in Sugar Creek follow through with the Swiss theme. But you won't need to exchange your American dollars. Continue a few minutes down State Route 39 and you'll find one of the busiest places in Amish country, Berlin. And yes, that's the right way to pronounce it, Berlin. Once a small burg on a state highway, Berlin has become a mecca for tourists and shoppers. Whether you're looking for quilts, chocolate, or country-style decorations, Berlin is the place to find it. Berlin is home to more than 15 inns, bed and breakfasts, and hotels, from Koblenz Country Cabins to Hannah's House Bed and Breakfast. And while the style may be country, the amenities aren't. Most of the newer inns boast pool tables, hot tubs, even satellite TV and data ports for your laptop so that you can visit the country without losing touch with the modern world. In fact, nowhere in Berlin does the modern world meet the old world quite like it does at the Dutch Harvest Restaurant and Schrock's Amish Farm. Joy von Allman is part of the family team that operates one of the biggest facilities in Berlin. Right it's all plated up, right there. From the down-home cooking at the Dutch Harvest to the upscale elegance of a full-service spa to handmade oak furniture and an Amish farm to a year-round Christmas shop. And Von Allman says if there's one thing that defines tourism now in Berlin, it's definitely the words year-round. Hannah's house here is booked every day, nonstop, every room. Um, the restaurant, from the time that you open your doors until you close, you've got a line out the door. I mean, it's, it is nonstop, and it's fun. It's a challenge. Um, it is definitely a challenge, but it is, we look forward to it. We actually look forward to it because it really definitely, um, it challenges you and everybody in your staff. And, uh, but then in November, so you're going from October, the busiest um, month of the year, and then in November you drop 50% of your business overnight, just one day. And, uh, and it has to do with the weather. 
And if the weather holds out, then, you know, that, that um, craziness uh, will go through November. Joy's father, John Schrock, built Schrock's Amish Farm, which has become a main stop in Berlin for many tourists. Schrock grew up the son of an Amish bishop. Since I was Amish, I was only allowed to have eight years of education, so I was a little handicapped on some of those things, but I found out that certain principles work, and so I capitalized on the principles that I knew and hired people for some of the skills I needed. Schrock's will let you hobnob with the cows or drive a buggy, not something that most city types do every day. From the back porch of the Valley View Inn, owner Nancy Lemke can see the traffic light in Berlin, and she's watched Berlin change in the past few years. It used to be that the Amish area uh, here in Ohio, which is the world's largest Amish settlement, uh, used to be a place where travelers would like stop on their way from point A to point B, and oh, we're going past there, we'll, we'll stop in and see what it looks like. Uh, then it became the destination point. Located a few minutes south of Route 39, guests at the Valley View Inn are close enough to shop in Berlin, but far enough away from the businesses to make it feel like the country. We had um, one couple that was checking in one day in the summer, and we had the windows open. And uh, as I was checking them in, the lady said, is that a tape that I hear? And at that time, I didn't have any music on. And I said, what are you listening to? And she said, I can hear crickets. Is that one of those nature tapes? And I said, no, that's the real thing. You know, we've got birds and crickets, and <laughs> this is the country. And also, it's an opportunity for people to see what it used to be like two or three generations ago in the farming community. They remember hearing about their granddad used to farm with a team of horses and so forth. It's almost like experiencing uh, a living museum. On Route 62 in Northeast Holmes County, you'll find Winesburg, Ohio. Home to a few small shops and a general store, travelers who stay at Winesburg's Grapevine Bed and Breakfast do it because they like the small town feel. We have met so many nice people over the years, over seven years we've been open. We watch the reservation book to see who's coming to who we're going to go out to supper with. Hostetler says as good as it may be for business, the development does worry him a little. If it changes as much in the next 20 years as it has in the last 20, it's really going to be, it's, it's, our roads are going to handle the people. We come down about once a month because they have a horse sale here once a month on the second Saturday of the month and we come down on Friday and go for their tax sale on Friday night and stay over and go down to the horse sale the next day and then I go visit with a lot of the Amish people. You know, the one thing I will say about the Amish around here, they all love, everybody's favorite pastime is to talk. You know, and they, they're friendly people. They will talk with anybody. You may have to initiate the conversation, but they will talk. And, you know, you, you, I won't say you can't embarrass them, but don't be afraid. They don't get embarrassed by you asking them questions, why you did this, why this, why that. Ask them those questions. You'll never know if you don't ask them. You might wonder how the Amish can continue to farm in Holmes County with all this business, but what travelers see along State Route 39 is only part of the Holmes County story. What you find here primarily is development along certain corridors. And a quarter of a mile behind those, you can forget they exist. You're right back in little gravel roads running through Amish farms, which is exactly what Holmes County is. They can become more and more successful in what they're doing and in, in promoting or in, in working in the tourism industry in a sense. Um, but I don't know if that takes them away from their core values and beliefs. It takes them it takes them into our world, and and they strive to be not of the world. So I I think it's going to become more and more difficult for the Amish to retain their core values and beliefs. 
Um, I hope they do. I admire them a lot. For visitors in Kidron, Ohio, Layman's Hardware is a must-see stop. In fact, the day we visited, the guest book included tourists from France and Hong Kong who came to visit a hardware store. Do you know the difference between a wood heating stove and a wood cook stove? This is a wood cook stove because not only can you cook on it, the entire surface becomes hot, you can also cook in it. It has an oven. The fire is over here. These are not burners, so if you would put your hand here, it would be just about as hot as if you would put your hand here. It's actually access so that you can clean out the stove. This is a water reservoir over here. The water becomes heated so that Grandpa can shave. After Grandma is done cooking a meal for the uh, eight children and 24 grandchildren she has over for breakfast. This stove is actually Amish made. We import it out of Canada. Located on Route 52 in Kidron, Layman's Hardware has everything you need if you're living without electricity. From wood-burning stoves to gas lamps, even kerosene-powered refrigerators. I bought the store in 1955. It had been a small one-room hardware store for about 30 years before that. And at the time, the man was retiring and I was looking for a job. So I bought the store and, and he was catering to the Amish people and I decided to continue to do that. For almost 20 years, Layman's remained a small operation until the oil crisis of the early 1970s hit. All at once, uh, electric oil and uh, gas seemed to be hard to get or maybe even run out. And so everybody wanted to go back to uh, what the Amish do uh, and with non-electric things like wood stoves and gas refrigerators and kerosene lights and things like that. And that's when we uh, really, our business really expanded very rapidly. The Layman's mail order catalog started to bring in business from all over the world. And Jay Layman found himself traveling the world for supplies. We buy uh, kerosene refrigerators in Sweden. We buy uh, mixers and grinders in Peru. And, but we do buy a lot of stuff locally. And a lot of the companies will only make these special things for us when they're not very busy. So we have to order a lot of it and then they'll make it in, in times when they're not busy. And, and so it is quite an art to know how much to order uh, because a lot of them, a lot of companies will not, it's not on their record production. In the late 1990s, fears of a Y2K meltdown in the power grid again fueled tremendous growth for Layman's. I never envisioned, envisioned that it would grow like that. No, I was primarily trying to cater to the local people uh, and do and to supply them with the, what they needed for their old washing machine, their stove and their lights and so forth. But uh, after it was, sort of became known all over the world that we had this, and it's surprisingly that that the majority of our business now is not with Amish people anymore, even though that's how we uh, intended it to be. 
but we found out that there are many more people that live without electricity uh, in the world than Amish people. And so our, our non-Amish business is the business in part that really grew the most. Part of that worldwide notoriety came after www.laymans.com went live. Jay Layman says it's not uncommon for a kerosene refrigerator order to come in via the web from places like Africa. I myself don't even get on the computer or the web. I, I really know nothing about it. And it is rather ironic that we do get a lot of orders from overseas for people who have no electricity. They go to, uh, to town on the weekend and order things from us through the web, and they go back to the remote area again. And uh, it's, uh, it's just rather ironic, but uh, it seems to work. Today, tourists from all over the U.S. and even other countries make layman's a stop on their travels. We didn't, uh, we didn't try to make it a tourist attraction. Uh, we didn't know we were a tourist attraction, but yes, the tourists do uh, come here, and not only in their cars, but in their buses and things, and it is a, a big tourist attraction now, yes. Tourists will find everything from cowbells to non-electric toys to water purifiers at Layman's, but one thing you won't find is film. For Layman's, it's a matter of respecting the traditional Amish prohibition of being photographed. Some people believe, incorrectly, that they don't like their photographs taken because it will steal their soul. Not quite sure where that came from, but actually it's based on one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not make any graven images. And to them, a photograph of yourself would be a graven image. Uh, many of the Amish also do not have mirrors in their homes for the same reason. Layman's is next door to the Kidron Auction House, one of Ohio's oldest operating livestock auctions, where Amish and English farmers alike bring everything from horses to baskets. The auction is held every Thursday, and it's open to the public. Tim and Sherry Andrews used to run a store that sold Amish-made furniture, but now Amish Alley exists only in cyberspace. Tim Andrews says the Amish brand carries a lot of weight in the marketplace, but Amish builders are just like any other craftsman. Just because it says Amish uh, doesn't mean necessarily that it's a great piece. You really have to find the people that not only will do good work, but they'll get it done in a timely manner. They're easy to work with. And over the years, we've, we've done that. Building oak furniture is one of the most common non-farm jobs for the Amish. And for people like the Andrews or the Schrocks, they know there's a market for Amish furniture because people perceive Amish made as meaning something special. To them, they would never do something that was sloppy or, I mean, not because they don't do it because they want to make money, but they do it because of their reputation. It's like they take pride in what they do. And so they'll, they'll go out of their way to do the best that they can and to create an image. They're, they like to stand back and say, like, I made that. That's my brand, you know. Sherry Andrews spends a lot of her time on the gravel roads in Holmes County, visiting the furniture shops to pick up orders. They don't really deal with a lot of women, so when you go down there, they kind of all look at you. Most of the time, it's the men. Now, sometimes their wives and stuff are there in the shop, and they kind of are the same thing, doing like the book work and stuff like that. But um, I usually get results. <laughs> Amish Alley ships furniture all over the world now, and Tim Andrews says the builders he works with have had to adapt to meet the demand. They'll have an English partner and all Amish builders so that they will have a phone there, a lot more convenient, a lot, you know, a lot more uh, enticing to the retailer. So it, I think it's starting, to, it's starting to become a little bit more inclusive, not to mention just the sheer number of people that are going down there. They just can't avoid it anymore. Tim Andrews says the time he spends in Holmes County and the time he spent working with Amish builders has changed his life. I think it would change anybody because it makes you kind of take a look at yourself and, and, and decide what's important. I think it's helped strengthen as far as my family values and things like that. A lot of the different travels that I take on the back roads, um, every time they see you, they'll wave. Everybody waves. The little kids wave. The older people, you know, they'll be pulling a wagon or whatever. They wave. And, you know, a lot of the people down there are friendly, but I think they know that when I'm going down there or when somebody's coming down there, they're either local, part of the community, or they're going down there to do business. 
Business travelers and tourists usually have a lot of questions about the Amish life, and when people ask questions, locals will often direct you to the Amish and Mennonite Information Center. The center is known for Behalt, a 10-foot by 265-foot cyclorama, illustrating the heritage of the Amish and Mennonite people from the Anabaptist beginnings in Zurich, Switzerland in 1525 to the present day. Uh, Heinz Gaugel, the artist who, who uh, created the psychorama here, began working on that project in 1978. Today, Behalt is one of the main attractions at the Amish and Mennonite Information Center. It draws thousands of visitors each year. So it's nice to have people actually daring to visit here and asking questions that it's not safe to ask anywhere else. So it's fun for me just simply to help people um, understand the truth of things. Visitors here can pick up books, both scholarly and not so scholarly, about Amish life, from the clothing to the buggies to resisting the influence of technology. The principle of being uh, separated from the world, and there are a variety of scriptures throughout the New Testament that deal with this. Uh, the Amish have chosen that to say that that really calls them to live very separate from the world, both in terms of the technology they've chosen to use, what they've allowed for themselves in the way of amenities in their homes, um, and, and the practices that they will follow. If you want to understand more about Amish life, the Halt and the Amish Mennonite Information Center is a good place to start. In fact, using the term the Amish is somewhat misleading as there are a variety of Amish orders. The main ones would be the new order, the old, the old order is the largest group, the new order, um, the Schwarzentruber Amish, there's the Andy Weaver Amish. The main differences between the groups would be in dress, buggy style, the way the church services would be conducted, uh, education to a certain extent, the role of women, it, it's far-reaching. The group that you're in pretty much can dictate everything you do in the way you live your life. But they all have one thing in common. They don't drive cars and they all have beards. And, uh, and uh, they wear their black hats and their, their clothing. But uh, they're more liberal. Some are allowed to farm with tractors. I say sometimes saying the Amish is like saying the Methodists. You know, we're all people and we're living our lives in a white farmhouse or in a brick townhouse and we all have jobs we have to go to, whether they're out in the back 40 acres or whether they're down the street in the retail store. We're all people. And we're all trying to live by some code of ethics, brought hopefully by our religion or by our peers or by our community. And we're doing our best with that. And the Amish feel the same way. John Schrock grew up in an Amish family and joined the Amish church. But when he decided that he no longer believed Amish customs were necessary to live a Christian life, he left the Amish church. The result? The son of an Amish bishop was shunned for years. It can be pretty difficult. People would cross the street when they see you walking on one side, they'll cross the street to see if they can miss you. And uh, it, it's like, they, it, it's not so much that they hate you as they want to avoid you because they don't want the confrontation. You knew. I mean, and I was little. I was maybe three. Um, you knew something wasn't right when we would go there and stuff. When we would go to weddings and, and funerals and stuff, we would have to eat in the basement away from everybody else. And it did, I mean, I guess that was normal because I didn't know anything different at that point. My mom and dad were beautiful people and they never agreed with me. They died without agreeing with me. I don't, I don't think they were angry or something like that. They're just different agreements as far as... When I explained to my dad that I respected everything that I was taught from a moral standpoint, but that I disagreed with the custom traditions, it helped him understand where it's from. And uh, when I talked about it, he would, he would say, you know, but, you know, you still just wish should be Amish because you're... You committed yourself to be Amish. You joined the church, and you, and, and I understood that. I mean, I, I understood that.
another film, Switzerland over here. Enjoy our beautiful Swiss murals while dining on the best and most delicious food in Amish country. For almost 65 years now, Alpine Alpa has been sitting at the gateway to Holmes County along Highway 62. In 1935, a bunch of Amish farmers got together and they, they decided to build a cheese factory. So it was a co-op and uh, it was just a, one little, just a little hole in the wall, practically cheese factory. And then in, uh, through the years, the owners, Alice and Hans Grossenklaus, kept buying the farmers out. And by 1951, they owned 51% of the shares. And they built the chalet, and then everything started growing around the cheese factory. Then we built uh, a, a restaurant. The restaurant was one of the earliest Amish kitchens in Holmes County. Built in a day before Interstate 77 and Route 39 through Sugar Creek became the gateway to Amish country. Even the annual Swiss Fest in Sugar Creek can trace its roots right back to Alpine Alpa. We held the first uh, Swiss Festival in Ohio and it was held right here on these premises. In 1938 was the first one and they continued to 1941 when uh, finally it was, uh, uh, the war stopped the, that. The restaurant serves up traditional Amish style cooking but has a style all its own, thanks to the dioramas created by artist Tom Miller. The connection to Switzerland is all around you as you dine, from indoor mountainous waterfalls to murals depicting Swiss history. And in addition to the restaurant, you can still find Alpine Alpa cheese made right next door. But when you visit Alpine Alpa, everyone knows what the real draw is. Alpine Alpa is really all about going cuckoo. The store is one of the world's largest retailers of cuckoo clocks, and selling the clocks is a tradition that dates back to 1962, right about the time that work began on the project that would really put Alpine Alpa on the map. They built the world's largest cuckoo clock. It was Alice Grossenklaus, the owner's uh, uh, idea. She had a nightmare one night at about 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we always called it Alice's Nightmares. And uh, she came up with the idea and she was ready to get up and go and call somebody on it. And uh, of course she had to wait till a decent hour till everybody was up. And then she called uh, Carl Schleuderman in Berea, Ohio, who was a German clockmaker. And uh, they got together and they pulled their ideas and they came up with building the world's largest cuckoo clock. That took about 12 years until they finally got somebody to get it, to get the idea of how to put it together and put it together. And in 1973, the cuckoo clock as you see it now uh, is the way it was brought up. The, the clock is about uh, uh, 23 and a half feet tall uh, by uh, uh, 24 feet wide, and it's about 13 and a half feet deep. And uh, they, it is consider, has, has been featured on the cover of the Guinness Book of World Records in 1978. It's been featured with Ripley's Believe It or Not and uh, various other, uh, and sundry other, other places it's been listed. 100,000 people uh, view the clock every year. That's just a rough estimate. We've had people from all over the world. I don't know of any country yet that hasn't been here. Almost every nation has been represented here at one point in time or another. All those visitors plunked down a mere 25 cents to see the record-breaking cuckoo, money that Craig says goes right back in to keeping the clock working like, like, well, like a clock. The clock puts on its show every 30 minutes for appreciative crowds who can then meander over to Dwarf Island before going back to the Swiss market where you can pick up a cheese wheel, maybe an Amish cigar or two, or even a $2,000 cuckoo clock. Even Craig himself is part of the attraction. Once known worldwide as Komar the Magnificent, he set a Guinness record for firewalking and is a veteran of The Tonight Show and Mike Douglas. But Alpine Alpa is the place he calls home. I started in 1948 with them and I've seen it grow from the hole in the wall to one of the top, le uh, top leading uh, tourist attractions in Holmes County.
So the next time you travel to Holmes County, try taking Route 62 instead of 77. Go past Alpine Alpa to a place where they've got a lot of time on their hands. We hope you enjoy your stay with us. Have a nice day. Auf Wiedersehen. Since the 1980s, tourism and development in Holmes County has exploded. But why do people travel by the busload to visit the Amish capital of the world? They come here because there's something about it. The farms are neat, they're hardworking people. Uh, when you go to a lot of farm areas, the fence rows are not trimmed and the gardens are not trimmed, but it's the gardens, it's the fence rows, the white fences, the, the upkeeping of the farm areas and land and the and it's all done by horses, it, uh, no tractors, you know, it's done by horses and that's kind of an old-fashioned way of life. And so people come for what I, what I consider they drive into an area and it's almost like I can't leave this. People sometimes come in here from the big cities and they almost get scared to say, where am I? You know, it's like, wow. I mean, I, because that's what they feel. They, 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 they feel I come up in this buggy and <clears throat> it's just so amazing. To them, they can't hardly believe that, that there's people around that live this way in the 21st century and they live like uh, 100 years ago. I think some people, uh, maybe some of the older folks, they look at it and say, yeah, that's how things were when we were little. Uh, I think a lot of the uh, people of my generation probably look at it and say, well, that's nice, but I don't think I could live that way. A lot of people admire the simplistic lifestyle and feel like maybe they'd like to be involved in it. But it doesn't take very long after they get home to forget all about it. Forget about living without electricity in the house and without television and without uh, CD. And uh, everybody having a separate car parked in the backyard and jumping in the car to go everywhere all the time. So it's, it's a momentary thing. But if it enriches their lives for a few minutes or gives them a little something to take home and, and change their life a little bit, then that's good. It's a good reminder of how life can be and how we need one another and should be there for one another. Um, that's part of the draw, I think, too. I think they want to absorb that. And that's, that's a wonderful thing for us to give them. If they come here and they absorb some of that, that sense of a better, a better way of living, that's good. We like that. We like sharing that. You don't have to worry about anything. You just forget about everything at home. You leave the bills there, the kids there, <laughs> the old man there, the husband there. <laughs> and you just have a very relaxing day. And I think it's just those old-fashioned values, sense of camaraderie, um, you know, things that we're missing, I think, in our lives for the most part, a lot of us. Uh, they don't, we don't have the same fellowship. I mean, there, if there's a problem, they all pull together, they help one another. I think it's a sense of admiration, really. I really do. That, that we wish, in a way, that we could um, live our lives and, and be able to slow down and take our time, help people when they're having problems, help each other, and hope that people would help us. And they just want to see, you know, how these people live and, and, and how they get by from day to day, not depending on our modern amenities that we have. Like me, it's nothing fancy. <laughs> it's uh, back in time, I guess. I've often said that I was born 50 years too late. Everybody's in a hurry, it's rush here, rush there, hurry up, get this done, and it's like you sometimes miss out on the enjoyment, you know, that you're supposed to have in your life, especially older that you, when you start getting older, <laughs> and you know, you're thinking, gosh, what have I done? I should slow down and start enjoying things more. People today are nostalgic for another time, a slower pace, a more innocent time, um, and I think that the Amish portray that in a lot of ways. Um, certainly the the quality of the woodworking, the food, that all the all of those things are wrapped up that harks back to that era that a lot of people I think are yearning for. Um, maybe especially in the last year too, I think people are are really yearning for that innocent time that is 
gone from a lot of places. It is a little more relaxed atmosphere uh, for those people when they come come down here um, and just enjoy you know the beauty that the country has as far as nature goes. When you talk to people who live in Holmes County and ask them about the future, they talk mostly about the past. I, I, I just can't believe how it's grown, especially in the uh, towns like uh, in Holmes County, Berlin, for instance. It's massive. Uh, bed and breakfast popping up all over the place. Uh, you know, it's one of the top tourist uh, destinations in the world now. And uh, it just amazes me. I guess it's just... Um, just the difference of the simplicity. We're still growing, we're still developing, but not at the rate we were during that 10-year period. And that 10-year period was one of the most startling things that we've seen in tourism in the country. For the Amish who live in Holmes County, the tourism boom has been... It is. It's, it's kind of like a double-edged sword in a way. Um, certainly their reaction to it would vary from group to group and even from person to person. I wouldn't say they necessarily embrace it, but in a certain sense they do need it. Um, so it's an interesting, it's a delicate situation and they recognize that and, and we do too. So we just, we just try not to exploit them. One of the biggest problems posed for the Amish of Holmes County by tourism is not so much the loss of farmland as it is traffic. Now don't be in a hurry, you didn't come here to be in a hurry. You came here to experience Holmes County. Getting behind a buggy at four miles an hour is part of the experience. So plan on it and don't, you know, don't get that, that eagerness to get around that's going to cause somebody to be hurt. Still, despite these warnings, every year there are accidents, and some of those accidents are fatal. And I remember seeing pictures of the buggies going by um, on their way to the funeral and just you know, legions of black buggies going by this road. I remember seeing pictures of that. The Amish are willing for other people to learn about them. That's fine. And they're very accepting of the fact that people come here perhaps to learn on a, on a pretty quick and fun level. But uh, they're more than willing to talk with people and answer questions and explain their faith because their faith is so deep. And um, their willingness to share how they've found a good life in their belief system. It's almost like they're becoming stars from being uh, so simple and wanting to be away from the spotlight, you know, opposed to the other way around. I hope in 10 years or 20 years that you see Holmes County as you see it today. It's a very beautiful, scenic, rural county with real farms and, uh, and still have some opportunities to enjoy some visitor activities and, and our hospitality. As far as their separate lives, they're able to maintain that. They can still live on their farms and go to their own, each other's homes for church and um, to each other's homes for the social events that occur in their, in their lives. 
Um, and they interact well with the non-Amish when they're out in a business setting and when they're out in a public setting, um, serving on boards in the community and being advisors to people like me. And I guess uh, each person has their own way of life and uh, it, whatever works for them is, uh, works for me, you know. But uh, I guess that's what freedom's all about, to do as you want. But a lot of the practices that I was taught from the Amish I really believed in and I really practiced them, which is such things as honesty, hard work, and uh, my dad taught me very, a lot of very good things. We operate by handshake and by our word, and um, it's just an easier way to live, being honest. And I mean, it's just so much easier than it is to try and to keep track of who you said what to and, you know, letting people down. I mean, that, why, why would you do that to yourself? Why would you want to be known to be that kind of person? Not, I mean, that's just, it's not for me. This is easy. I think they choose the hard road. I really do. The Amish are worldly. They're, they're perceived as being very protected and isolated. But they're very, very intelligent people and very well read. And um, they do know, they do know what's going on out around them. And they still maintain very solid core of family and church life. That's an inspiration for the rest of us. You know, we can be involved in, in today's world and the things that happen in today's world without giving up that sense of value that lives within us. And, uh, it's our hope that we can protect that, protect that. They're happy with less. Um, it, the simplicity of their lives impresses a lot of people, including myself. And it's interesting too that um, everybody I know that knows Amish people says, oh gosh, I admire them so much. I just admire their life, but oh, I could never do that, you know. simple life, but it's the best life really.
election results will have a lot to do with what happens in 2003. There you think we may have more action. Could be. Depends on what the election outcome is going to be. And still, we're still 11 months away from it. But there's not much reason to expect a change in either House right now. Uh, the Republicans will probably hold on to the House. Democrats will probably hold on to the Senate. But there's a lot of uncertainty. If the economy turns out to be worse, it could be more negative for Republicans. If Bush's popularity remains high, it could be more negative for Democrats. So there's a lot of uncertainty, even though the best expectation is for a status quo outcome in the November elections. If that's the case, it's going to be hard to reach agreement on many issues after the 2002 elections. The polls in indicate, our poll certainly indicates, that the president's popularity is extraordinarily high, that his influence appears to be in domestic as well as in foreign policy. It, it, does that extend to the world of Washington? Does he have more power than he did six months ago? I, I think that he does. and I think you saw that in the amount of legislation that passed after September 11th. At the close of the session, all the focus was on the stimulus plan, and that did fail. But it did pass a number of other pieces of legislation related to September 11th. And so I think it, if, in part, is the result of his popularity. Thanks very much, Tom Gallagher, as always, a disinterested view of a very interested capital. And there we do have to stop with many thanks to my ten terrific guests and to you for joining me in our annual Look Ahead, which has never before come at such a critical turning point for America and the world. I hope we have helped you make that turn. And let's hope that the next 12 months will bring you happiness and peace in your finances and in your life. I'm Louis Rukeyser, wishing you a much more wonderful 2002. Louis Rukeyser's 2002 Money Guide is produced in association with Rukeyser Television Incorporated by Maryland Public Television, made possible by Deloitte and Touche. Markets may rise or they may fall. Who helps companies prepare for the unpredictable? For business advisory services, the answer is the people of Deloitte & Touche. By A.G. Edwards, providing a full range of personalized financial, retirement, and estate planning services. A.G. Edwards, trusted advice, exceptional service by Oppenheimer Funds. Insight, teamwork, discipline. The strategy Oppenheimer Funds uses to achieve long-term performance. Oppenheimer Funds, the right way to invest. And by Occidental Petroleum. At Occidental Petroleum, we employ advanced technologies for oil and gas recovery while helping preserve the environment of the world we all share. For a printed transcript of this program, send $5 to Transcripts, Louis Rukeyser's 2002 Money Guide, Maryland Public Television, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Transcripts are also available online. This is PBS.